Greetings to you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hello, I am Vinod Venkatraman and uh, I hail from the state of Kerala of India. I was born and brought up in a very orthodox Hindu Brahmin family. On 12th December 1983, we as a family were about to commit mass suicide. That's about 37 years back. I just want to share with you, how is that a person who is supposed to be dead and done 37 years before is still alive? What does that happen in my life which has made me to survive that suicide attempt and still be with you today? To start with, I just want to read a verse from the Holy Bible, the book of Job, chapter 42, and verse 2 says like this. Let me just read it for you. If any of you have your Bible with you, you can just turn to Job, the book of Job, which is right before Psalms, chapter 42, verse 2. Let me just read it. I know that you can do all things, no purpose of yours can be throttled. I just want to tell you one thing, maybe toward the end of my speech, you all will come to know that the God whom I am worshipping and whom I am serving is capable of doing everything and none of his plans will be throttled. I thank once again the Lord Jesus for giving me this great privilege to meet you through this webcast. As I said, we as a family, we hail from this orthodox Hindu Brahmin culture. We hail from a place called Kolongod, which is a part of northern Kerala, which is a bordering place to Tamil Nadu. In 1960s, as well, my parents who were like, uh, they don't know each other at that time, they weren't married, they moved out of Kerala for official purpose to get a job and for the livelihood. My mom, she moved with the parents to a place called Jamshedpur and my grandfather, he started working in uh, Tata Steels as their audit manager. And my father, he was moved into Tamil Nadu where he got a job, he was growing and flourishing in the job. By the time they got married, he was a manager in a shipping firm which was involved in the activities of uh, stevedoring and ship channeling and those kind of things. Dad was earning good, very well settled. Mom also was the only child to her parents, so pampered and loud and uh, provided with much more than what she asked. They both got married, the married life started off very well. Dad was a very orthodox devotee or this Lord Ayapa, which he has a temple in a hill station called Savarimala. He was a devotee who visit that shrine twice a year. For almost 22 years he did that. Dad's life started off very well. Happily their married life started. One out of the other children were born. I am the eldest. I had three brothers. And I have one sister. I hope you are listening to me keenly. Let me repeat. I had three brothers. I have one sister. Today I am just going to share with you what does that happen in our life which completely made us upside down. Dad started off his work and his family life. Everything was going so smoothly. With his friends, as we all do, he do socialize. Every now and then, maybe once in a blue moon day, once in a month, he just go, have some, uh, you know, like a fellowship with his friends, spend some time. One of his friends who was working together with him saw the growth of dad in his work. Automatically, jealousy came into him. He was trying to pull dad down to several ways, which he could not, but he could not go ahead with. 
But then finally what he did was, he catch hold of somebody who is good at witchcraft. He did some kind of a witchcraft against my dad. So dad became an addict to alcohol from that point of time. He started to drink and drink and drink. If you have your Bible, just turn with me to the book of Proverbs, which is right after Psalms, and uh, chapter 23. If we move there, we can see towards the end, the verses of chapter 23, the writer, he explains here, starting verse 29, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has strife, who has complaints, who has needless bruises, who has bloodshot eyes, those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. And he tells us, when the wine is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly, do not gaze at wine. Because in the end, it will bite like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I am not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? This was the exact story of my dad. He became a hardcore addict to alcoholism. Because of his habit, he lost his job. He thought, I don't need a job now. I know people, I have contacts. I'm good enough in my work, I have money, so he started his own business. In over three months time, he has to wind it up. Several other ventures he ventured into. Everything was entered into a loss. He could not stand firm in any of his, the ventures that he ventured into. Then he thought, let me just open up a general store. Non-perishable items I'll sell. Nothing can happen to that. He opened up the sh shop, spending a huge amount of money. There was a lot of money at home because mom, she being a only child for her parents, they gave almost, I heard, about 1.5 kilos of gold, even more than that. And there were houses, all, all utensils that you need, everything was there at home. So he started that shop. He kept two of them two of the people for walking there, and he tried running the shop. Every day morning he goes, the moment he gets 50 or 100 rupees in the cash box, he will just walk off with her to the shop to drink. He left the whole store into the hands of the servants. Within six months' time, they completely looted everything. Other than the shelves, there was nothing. Again into loss. Then dot, dad, he thought, there is no need for me to work anymore. I have so much money, generations of mine can sit and eat without working. So his life was like this, when will I wake up so that I can drink again? But dad, as I said, he used to go to that hilltop shrine twice a year. During those days, he used to take a fast. I don't know what happens to him, but during that period, he doesn't consume alcohol. We get to see our dad as our own dad. My mom, she used to get to see her husband as how he used to be. We enjoy that period. But it will perish very soon. The moment he comes back from the temple, on the way itself, he will be fully drunk. And he will be coming and serving the things that were devoted to those gods and goddesses in a complete set of mindset filled with alcohol. Again, our counting starts. When will dad go back there? Slowly, we started losing our money. The assets started eroding. One after the other, dad started selling. And then the rest, he started keeping it for loan and taking money. But there was no income, so he could not pay back anything. About 12 years of time went off. In 1971, dad and mom, they got married. By the time 
it was 1982 and 83. We lost completely everything. There was nothing for us left. We don't even had food to eat. You won't believe I just had a pair of trousers, a shorts maybe, and a t-shirt. Nothing else. If mom has to wash that and put it for drying, me being 10, 11 year old at that time, I was 72 born, 1972. I had to stand naked because there was only one towel at home. There was tremendous pressure upon mom. Dad was like this. Somebody will come and say, your husband is lying somewhere. Maybe next day somewhere else. Mom has to go pick him up, put him in a rickshaw and bring back home and make him sleep. By the time we all woke up, he's already gone. We were so much wondering, there was no money even for us to eat food. But somehow or other, he manages to get drinks. He used to drink. This slowly, slowly, slowly started affecting mom. She slowly started developing a hatredness towards her husband. By seeing the life of her only daughter, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, they both died because of heart attack within three months of span. There was no relatives who were willing to cope up with us. There was no friends to my dad. Everybody has given up because from everybody we have taken money but we have not paid back to anybody. To a house owner, there was a pending rent of about six months. One day he came and he said, kindly just leave my place. I know you could not pay back past six months rent. I'm just writing it off. Please vacate and give me. We came to the streets. One of the um, colleagues of my dad's who was a peon in his office, he was a Muslim uncle. He took us to, to his home, gave us shelter and food for the next six months. Our life was literally changed. From a very luxurious life, we were literally into deep poverty. We don't know how we are going to eat. We don't know what's the next step that we are going to take. We slowly, slowly lost all hope. Several people came and gave several counsels to my mom. She started visiting temple after temple. She started visiting priest after priest. She started doing all the rituals that they asked her to do. But there is no change in the life of that. In 1982 and 83, when he was just going to those shrines, which I was just mentioning before, they used to carry a bag packed with few items which they used to worship the deity there. Along with that, he used to carry his liquor bottle also. On the way to the temple, he drinks. In the temple shrine, he will drink. On the way back, he will drink. Little bit of hope that we had, only at least during those time he won't consume alcohol, even that was shattered. Mom started losing all her hope. In between she got a small job in a nursery school, taking care of some nursery kids. She used to earn about 400 rupees a month in 1981, 82, 83. We don't know where dad will be, but on the first of every month he'll come home. He will beat mama. He will abuse her and he will snatch the salary cover and run away. Again, one month of struggle and starving. All these things added up to the hatredness into moms. She started hating him. The hatred got converted into wrath. By the time I lost about two of my brothers, one was a 10-month-old boy, and the other was a 10-year-old boy. This is how it goes. In 1982, the 10-month-old boy was affected with cholera. And you might be knowing the symptoms for cholera as vomiting and diarrhea. We admitted him into a government hospital. We didn't have funds to take him to any private hospital. They treated him maybe about, I think, 16 or 17 days. Several bottles of blood and saline were just given as IV unto him. They discharged him. 
we could see that his vomiting and his diarrhea stopped. By the time he came back home, two days he was okay. On the third day morning when mom was just trying to feed him, she found her son to be dead and no more. That's when we rushed to a private hospital and we came to know he was affected with cholera. The hospital, the government hospital was able to treat the symptoms but not the sickness. This was a big thud in mom's heart. She became so sad and sorrowful. Again people came, consoled her, comforted her and gave her hope by making her to visit several other deities and do several other rituals. Nothing paid off. In 1983 October, the same thing happened to my next brother called Vimal. He just completed his ninth year, that was his birthday. Mom cooked some puri and some, you know, like potato sabji. We all ate. Some leftover was there. He just took that up and wanted to give it to the, there was a circus team which was just doing circus on the roads. He went, distributed it and came back. He started a vomiting and loose motion. Mom took him, rushed him to the hospital, which is about 13 kilometers away from my home. He was there for about a week. My landlady, by the time we shipped it to a house, my landlady, auntie said, you know, why can't you just go inquire about your brother and come back? We went, we inquired about him. And I found him. Mom said, he has been treated well. His loose motion and vomiting has stopped. God willing, tomorrow he will be discharged. So I'll come back, take care of your brother and your sister. I'll come and cook good food. So with a lot of hope and happiness, I came back home. The next day morning, in a cycle rickshaw, about 12 in the noon, mom reached our home. We all were wondering, how come mom could come in a rickshaw? Because the bus stop is hardly 100, 200 meters away from our home. No rickshaw person will come for such a short distance. By the time mom reached home, she just fainted on the rickshaw itself. My younger brother was lying on her lap. She just fainted upon him. Even then there was no movement upon, on him. So the auntie ran and she sprinkled some water and asked mommy. Mommy's name is Lalita. So she called, Lali, what happened? She said, oh, my elder sister, what can I tell you? Vimal is no more. Morning he had, he was just saying he was thirsty. So I went to a nearby tea shop to get him some hot water. By the time I came back, the next bed people said he has done a no more. He had hiccups thrice <laughs> like this, thrice, and then he has done an over. Same issues. They treated the symptoms but not the sickness. I didn't have any money to bring the cops to my home, on the dead body of my son to my home. So I have to tell lies to the rickshawala. I didn't have money. They are not treating him. I could not say that it's a dead body, else he won't come. So for 13 kilometers, I was just carrying this child in my lap, and I was sitting in this hot sun to reach home. It took some four to six hours time here to reach here. Dad came to know this. He came back. He started beating his heart and he started crying and telling mom, Lali, I know all this is because of me. Hereafter, I will never drink. I have given up alcoholism. I know it's all happened because of me. He was just lying on, a, on, his, on her feet and asking her forgiveness. So mom thought, it's good even after losing two of my sons. If my husband can change, nothing like it, because we have three more children. All the cremation and everything happened. Dad was not consuming alcohol as he promised, but all that withstood for another three to five days. On the sixth day, again he started drinking. Mom got very furious. A lot of arguments happened before that. No changes in his life. That's when her hatredness 
became wroth and wrath prompted her to murder him. Just to kill him, she bought poison. On 12th night, December 1983, she bought poison. She cooked rice and in the broth of the rice, she mixed up poison. She fed the rice to all three children, which is me and my brother and my sister. We all ate and we slept. Mom was waiting for dad to come so that she can feed him the poisoned broth and kill him. And then her plan was to make us, the children, drink that and she will also drink and we as a family commit mass suicide because there was no further hope for us. On that night when mom was just mixing up this poison, tears were running down in her eyes. She started shouting. We were in a Hindu religion. We have been taught there are 33 crores of God and goddesses, like 33 millions of God and goddesses. She started calling one after the other, name by name. And she started screaming, if at all there is any true living God who can hear me, who can see my sorrows, who can understand my situation. And if you just come down to help us, to save us from this situation, I will follow you and I'll just go back following you and you alone. We don't have time to live, but we want to live. We don't have an option in front of us, but we don't want to live. I don't know what to do. If at all there is any true living God, please come and help us. Like a mad woman, she was just literally crying wholeheartedly. You know, Peter, when he was just preaching at the house of Cornelius, he is making a statement, which we can read in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 34. We'll, we read like this. You can also just turn with me. Book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 34. It says like this. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favor to some. Verse 35 but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Also just turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, when God is just telling Moses about the Israelites who are being tortured by the Egyptians in Egypt. He says here like this, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their sufferings. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. You know what happened? Mom was just keep on crying. All of a sudden, this room was illuminated. As such, it was glowing. Thousands of lights were glowing. There was a huge pillar of light which is ascended from above. From that light there came a voice calling my mother by name, my dear daughter Lalita. I am the true living God whom you have been screaming out to. My name is Jesus Christ. Only me and me alone can save you. Other than me there is no other savior who is there in this world to save people from eternal death. Lalita, if you believe me, you will see the glory of God. And I will not just save you from this physical death and also from eternal death. Lalita, do you believe me? Mom was so astonished. And she started telling the Lord, the voice that came, how can I believe you? I've just heard about you in my convent times. My God and goddesses could not do whom I have been serving for years together now. How could I believe that you will change my husband? How could I believe that you will redeem me? How could I believe that you will give me back a new life? The Lord caught all of her hand and took her by hand to a temple. This voice now has changed into a trance, a vision. Mom was seeing in that vision, Lord was just holding her hands and taking her in front of a temple. There were three people who were begging, a leper, a blind, and uh, lame. Jesus touched all the three of them. 
the lame started to walk, the leper was healed from his leprosy, the blind started to see, Jesus started telling mom, I have cleansed today all the leprosy of sins from your life. I sprinkle pure water upon you. You will be cleansed. And he said all that is in darkness in your life is going to start seeing light from today onwards. You will no more be in darkness. All that is stagnated like a lame foot will start moving. Tomorrow morning, 6.15, only your husband will come. When he comes and knocks the door, you just share with him all that you have seen. And you take him to Rope Street, to Assemblies of God Church. In that church, there is a pastor by name Jebamani Das. He will explain you what more you have to do. On that night, after seeing this vision, mom slept then and there in the kitchen itself. You know, if mom would have not slept on that 12th night, December 1983, today I won't be standing in front of you. That's why at the beginning I just read a verse for you from Job 42, verse 2. None of your purposes can be throttled. My mom purposed to kill my dad and to get rid of us as a family. But God purposed me, us, especially me for that matter, today, to be with you and glorify this God to this testimony. See, you could see whose purpose has been fulfilled. Mom started hearing somebody knocking the door. You know one thing the psalmist says, God gives sleep to his beloved. Whatever be your situation, how much ever trauma that you are undergoing, whatever be hopeless be your situation, how much ever pressures and pain that you are undergoing, whatever be your suffering, you know, if you look up to this God, whose name is Jesus, he is the hope giver. He is the hope of glory. He will come into you and he will fill you with the hope and his glory. He is the only hope for the hopeless. He is the one he will give you glory. He will just lift you up from the ashes. And he will lift your head. Somebody was knocking the door. Mom went and opened up the door. It was dad. Exactly the time was 6.15. I'm talking about a God who just tells if he says it is done and over. He will never go back from his words. Mom started explaining this to my dad. Initially he was very resistant. He was just beating mom. Saying, what nonsense are you talking? You're trying to convert a Brahmin into a Christian? Who poisoned you? But later, God gave wisdom to mom and grace to my dad to accept it. They both went to Rope Street. There God showed them these assemblies of God's church. When they started entering, there was a voice just coming from inside. Brother Vangatraman, please come in. I've been waiting for you. Dad was surprised to hear somebody calling him by his name. Dad went and asked that person, Are you Pastor Jabamani Das? Yes, he said. Then Dad started laughing and said, Oh, now I can understand. You and my wife have met before. You are the one who poisoned her. And you have already converted her as a Christian. And through her, you are trying to convert me also. You both are playing this drama to make me a Christian. Never it will happen. The pastor said, brother, don't get annoyed. As how I am seeing you for the very first time. I am seeing your wife also for the very first time. The God who came in a vision to your wife last night, came in a dream unto me. And he explained everything about you. Let me tell you, your father had two wives. Your mother is a second wife, whom he married after the death of his first wife. Your mother had seven children. Only six are alive now. The first one was dead when he was a baby. Out of you six, there are two boys and four sisters. And you are the youngest. Dad again started laughing. He said, all this information my wife also knows. That's what I was just telling you. Then the pastor said, it nodded over Mr. Venkatraman. Dear brother, 
I will tell you one incident, rather two, then you will understand that I know things which your wife also even don't know. It is not by my ability I know this. The God who wants to call you has revealed those things unto me. And he started telling me, Dad, five of you were together consuming alcohols. Four of your friends were dead and over because their liver got ruptured. And you also, have, your liver is also ruptured now. You have been only given a three months no time to live. Is it true? And above that, your wife doesn't know this. Is it true, Mr. Venkatraman? Dad started crying. He was broken. He started to weep like a child. He asked the pastor, Pastor, tell me what should I do? The pastor said, See, Venkatraman, do you want to lead a life free of this addiction of alcohol? Do you want to get rid of this death which is fast approaching you? On top of all these things, do you want your sins to be forgiven? Do you want to be saved from the power of sin so that you no more sin? Do you want it be entering the eternal life and be with God in eternity? There is only one way, just repent and turn unto this God Jesus who came in the vision to your wife. Confess all your sins in front of him and plead unto him to ask him to forgive you and cleanse you with his blood. And then with your mouth, you confess that Jesus will be my Lord from today onwards. I won't be leading a life according to my own whims and fancies and my will and wish. But rather, as I am confessing Jesus as my Lord, I will be under his Lordship. And I will ask him to rule over me. And whatever he says, only I will do that. Whatever he shows, only I will do that. Wherever he wants me to go, only I will go there. If you do this, Brother Venkatraman, God in his mercy, who is full of grace, and who is compassionate, who has called you, who has chosen you even before the beginning of the world, will forgive you, will cleanse you with his blood, and give you a new life. Dad started confessing all his sins. He was just literally so crying and crying. He confessed by his mouth that Jesus is his Lord. And he believed in Jesus according to the gospel that the pastor explained unto him. And he believed that Jesus, the savior of the world, the God, the only true God, who came down in human flesh and died as the restitution for the forgiveness of sin of the human mankind. And on the third day, he was risen by the Lord Almighty from among the dead for our righteousness. And that day, 13th December 1983, God in all his mercy through Jesus Christ forgave all the sins of my dad completely completely delivered him out of the addiction of alcohol. He saved him from the chains and the power of sin. On the same day, dad got baptized in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit and he wore Jesus, he was clothed with Jesus and he joined the church on that day. It was 13 December 1983. He was about to die in three months. The God in his mercy extended his life for another 20 long years. In those 20 long years, dad never ever consumed alcohol anymore. He got rid of all his worldly habits. On top of all this, he got back his job and a position and started earning as much as he used to be even much more than that. God started using him mightily. And above of all this, he started witnessing this only true God who pulled him from this pit and cleansed him and made him to stand firm in Christ. He started witnessing him among lot many non-believers and Gentiles. More than 50 families came to know this true living God through my dad. He, start, he was working along with his work 
he was pastoring a small church of about 100, 150 people. How wonderful is this Lord, you know. We were not knowing him. We were worshipping idols. We were worshipping creatures. We were worshipping so many things which are not at all God, which were man-made. But this true living God who came down as a beam or as a pillar of light and revealed himself unto mom. That's how we as a family were saved from the physical as well as the eternal death. My dear friends, I just want to offer you this time to ask you if any of you have not yet accepted this Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you haven't believed upon him that he died just for you and your sin to save you from eternal death, if you believe upon him, as we see in Acts chapter 10 verse 43, to those who ever believe in his name will receive the forgiveness of sin, which is redemption according to Ephesians 1 7. And that's possible through his blood, which cleanses us from all our sins. Not only that, as we see in Romans 3, 23, 24, everybody sinned and, shall and fall short of his glory. But those who believed in him through that redemption, he freely made them righteous. My dear friends, the scripture says, there is no one righteous. There's no righteous, not even one. But there is a great possibility. The only way that you can become righteous is by getting your sins forgiven. That's possible only you calling upon the name of Jesus. This is the time for you to repent for your sin and turn unto God and confess it unto him, all your sins. And in his mercy, he is full of mercy. He is full of grace. He is a great compassionate God. He will forgive you today. He will cleanse you from all your sins. He will get rid of all those idols which have taken the prime place in your life. And he will come inside you. And he will reign over you. He will take up the throne in your life. And he will become your Lord if you confess him to be. The scripture says, to becoming a righteous, you believe unto him, and to be saved from the power of sin, you confess Jesus as Lord. Here is a great opportunity. A God is a God who will deliver you from all your addictions, from all your sin. Here is a great opportunity, my dear friends, to lead a life without sin. To lead a life as how Jesus lived. To lead a life pleasing unto God. To lead a life obeying every single command of God. If you are struggling, come on, this is the time. I came to know this Lord at the age of 11. My life was so wonderful, growing in the Lord. I was very good at Sunday schools. I used to learn all that they teach. I was first in everything. I was the one who will quickly take up. The Bible references when the preacher is reciting that. I was the one who used to clap with the loudest sound. If someone claps with a better sound than me, I get upset. I go back home and try clapping and clapping and clapping, practicing it. So I was ahead of everybody. And everybody was praising me. Everybody was quoting me as an example. But after my grade 10th exams, I went to study diploma in textile technology in a place which is about 300 kilometers away from my home. I stayed in the hostel. I had no Christian friend there. At home, there was a lot of pressure for you to pray and to read Bible and to buy heart verses and to tell that your mom, then only you will get breakfast. There is no such torture. There is no such restrictions in the hostel. 
I became a very free man. Slowly, slowly, slowly. I started drifting away from the Lord. Because there was no prayer life. I was not a regular reader. I became a, I just stopped reading the scriptures. Slowly I started giving up, going for fellowship meetings. I drifted away into worldly passions. I know the alcoholism, how bad it was, how difficult it has made our life, how much we were troubled because of that. Even knowing all those things, I again went into alcoholism. Over and above that, I started smoking. I ended up telling lies. I used to smoke about 40 cigarettes a day. I consume a lot of alcohol. But when I come home, I cannot be like that. Because I was fearing my dad and my mom. You know, most of us are like that. My dad and my mom, they don't know what I'm doing in my hostel. My brothers, they don't know what I'm doing in my hostel. My pastor doesn't know what I'm doing in my hostel. None of my friends know what I'm doing in my hostel. In my private life, how I am, none of them knows. So I was just thinking, I am deceiving each and every one of them because I'm smart enough. But when I come home, I cannot be like that because I fear my dad and my mom. You know what is unfortunate? There is a God who sees everything. In front of him, everything is open and naked. You cannot cover up anything. Even whatever you watch underneath your bedspread, inside your bathroom, covered inside your book, your mom doesn't know, your father doesn't know, your friend doesn't know, even your pastor doesn't know. You can fool all of them. But my dear friend, I, I didn't know that. There's one God who sees everything, who knows everything who is watching you every minute, rather every second, you cannot run away from his sight. I didn't have this revelation or this understanding. Because of that, I never feared God. You know, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, I think, it says like this, fearing God is hating evil. Not doing evil is not fearing God, my friends. Hating evil is what fearing God. I never had fear of God. When I came home, I could not be what I used to be. So what I used to do, I used to wear a mask of righteousness, a mask of holiness, a mask of godliness, you know, my dear friends, Paul is writing to Timothy in his letter, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Practice godliness, he exercise godliness. My dear friends, if we do not exercise godliness, we have to pretend to be godly. We have to act that we are godly. We will have to deceive people to make them falsely understand what we are not actually. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, bad company spoils good character. Irrespective of whom you are, irrespective of how long you have stayed with the Lord, irrespective of how beautiful Christian family that you belong to, irrespective of whose child you are, be it a pastor or a priest or X, Y, Z, whoever it is. If you get into bad company, it will spoil your good character. It's a done deal. <laughs> I was lusting. I was covetous. I was a drunkard. I was a chain smoker. I was a hypocrite. Yeah. See, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 3, it says, if you think you are a somebody, when you are a nobody, you deceive your own self. 
you don't need satan to come and deceive you you will become satan himself and you will deceive your own self that's what i was doing i thought i was deceiving everybody and i thought i was smart but the scripture is saying we know you are a fool because you are deceiving your own self my diploma education got over i got a job i started earning quickly my salary rose up to five digit and then to six digit i got married i god gave me a beautiful wife he blessed with me two wonderful with two wonderful boys we got a transfer from chennai to delhi the first ever one in my office history of about 21 years to be transferred from a regional office to a head office at delhi a very wanted person i became a very wanted person in the industry very well known i became a textile expert i worked for about 20 years i started earning a lot of money i had all kind of luxury at life i moved in into a company which is based at san francisco heading their entire asia regional work of product development we were a wholesaler of home textiles there was money there was fame there was everything but still i don't have a true relationship with my lord i know so many of us are like that we pretend to be righteous we pretend to be holy we pretend to be godly because we do not exercise godliness we don't have a private prayers we never read the scriptures as we are ought to be praying and reading the scriptures has become a duty for us you know jeremiah in his book in chapter 15 i think verse 16 he says let me just read it for you a minute jeremiah chapter 15 verse 16 when your words came i ate them they were my joy and my heart's delight they were my joy and my heart's delight it's like eating sweets and ice cream for jeremiah the word of god it was never run to me like that in those days even if i have been asked to pray i'll just run and pray and get over i never wanted to spend time with my lord i never wanted to fellowship with him you know 1 corinthians chapter 1 was 9 says like this let me just read it for you that also 1 corinthians chapter 1 was 9 it says like this god is faithful who has called you you my dear friend into fellowship with his son jesus christ our lord our main calling he has called us and he has made us righteous is basically to fellowship with this lord not to pretend i was just earning i had money i had home i have car i have beautiful wife i have wonderful children i have position i have fame i have beauty everything was there i had health i was prosperous because these are the measure that which which with which we measure the blessings of god you know but god is telling one thing to israelites to jacob in the book of malachi we can see that in the book of malachi chapter 1 verses 2 i think it says like this I have loved you says the Lord but you ask how have you loved us was not Esau Jacob's brother declares the Lord yet I have loved Jacob but Esau I have hated have you ever thought of this my dear friends Esau sold 
his first birthright. No issues were there with Esa. Esa married wives according to his pleasure, which though it grieved his parents, but nothing happened to him. He did all that is against the Lord. Nothing happened to him. He was given Mount Seir, a wonderful place to live. There were princes in his generation. He was leading a beautiful life. But on the other hand, we can see Jacob, who was struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling. His brother hated him. His father, he has to deceive his father. So he was deceived by his father, by his father-in-law. At least ten times his father-in-law changed his wages. His life was full of deception and problems and pain and suffering. You know why? God is telling Jacob, I love you. Esau, I hate. In Esau's life, nothing is happening. He is so beautifully leading his life. And you say you hate him. But to me, you say you love me. But I have been tortured left, right and center. Israelites were put into 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Except two of them, all the 6,3548 men who came out of Egypt along with Caleb and Joshua, all of them were dead in the desert and God is telling, no, 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 I love you. Can you believe this? The writer of Hebrew says in chapter 12, verse 6, the God disciplines those who love him. My dear friend, even after you're running wild, even after you live a hypocritical life, even after you leading a life deceiving many, even after you leading a life without any true relationship with the Lord, if still you are growing, you are prosperous, you are healthy, the God is not disciplining you, you have to be afraid you are heading towards hell. In my life, when everything was okay, I was affected with a skin problem called psoriasis. It started off like a dandruff in my head. Then it moved into my ears. I started getting some silvery patches. Then to my neck. Then to my elbows. Then into my hand. Then my entire body, head till foot. By the year 2008, I was completely spread with this sickness. Like the scales of the fish, I used to peel off my skin. About three to four dustbins full of skins we gather daily. When I peel off, the blood will ooze. Psoriasis, it aggravated and it ended up into psoriatic arthritis. Both my hip, my knees and my ankle joints were affected. I could not take a step ahead. I have to resign my job. I lost about 35 kilos of weight. My face got marred because of this. I almost became like a leper. I used to cry day and night with pain. You know, in the book of Job, chapter 33, there is a verse which I just want to read it for you. Book of Job, chapter 33. Even today morning, I was just reading that with my father-in-law. And we were meditating on that. Here it says like this. Verse 14. For God does speak. Now one way, now another. Though no one perceives it. In a dream, in a vision of the night. When deep sleep falls on people. As they slumber in beds. He may speak in their ears. And terrify them with warnings. To turn them from wrongdoing. And keep them from pride. To preserve them from the pit the lies from perishing by the sword. Or someone may be chastened on a bed of pain, 
with constant distress in their bones, so that their body finds food repulsive. I could not eat food. The skin that peels off is all protein. I started losing protein. I lost about 35 kilos of weight. From 83 kilos, I all of a sudden became 48. Very thin, very weak. With all my bones paining 24-7, I could not even turn to take x-rays, to conduct any test. The doctors used to struggle minutes and hours to find a nerve in my hand to insert the IV needle so that they can feed me. That's what it says here. For someone may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in their bones so that the body finds food repulsive. Verse 20 I'm reading. And the soul loathes the choicest meal. The flesh wastes away to nothing. And their bones once hidden now stick out. They draw near to the pit and their life to the messengers of death. My life was like that. I lost my job. I, I lost everything. I lost everything. I was admitted into a hospital called Ernakulam Medical Center, which is in Cochin, Kerala. I came to attend my in-laws' wedding, but I could not. I was bedridden. They asked me that both your hip joints, both your knee joints, and both your ankle joints are all gone and over. We it's not a rheumatoid arthritis so that we can treat you with steroids. No, this is psoriatic arthritis. We cannot give you steroids because that will aggravate. So they said the only possibility is do six operations, six replacements of joints. All these things will be replaced with hardened plastic. It will take six months for six surgery. After that 18 months of physiotherapy, you will walk like a robot. I just said, God, I cannot bear this pain. If not one day, two day, 2008, 9 and 10, I was three years, I was suffering severely because of this. Then uh, on 24th June 2010, I decided to commit suicide. Even before that, several attempts I have made. I said, right to you, Job 42.2 says, I know that I can, you can do everything and none of your purposes can be throttled. <clears throat> Several plans I made to commit myself, suicide myself. But nothing worked up. On 24th, I wanted to just kill myself by snapping my nose. That was a Sunday. My wife and children, they went to the church. All of a sudden, from the middle of the assembly, they called me. She said, I'm coming back to the hospital. I could not be there. Oh, I started, you know, feeling sad. Oh, if she comes, I cannot die. I told her, please don't come, finish up the worship and then come. She said, no, I'm not coming. Sorry, I'm not being there. Sorry, I'm coming back. And I told her, I just want to change the topic that we are talking. I asked her, what were they preaching today? She said it was from Psalm 118. You please read it by the time I come back. I was praying unto God, God, I know if I commit suicide, I might end up in hell. And I was asking God, God, can you show me a passage from the scripture which can strengthen me that even after committing suicide, I can still go to heaven. I thought that's the answer that God is giving me through my wife from Psalm 118. I kept the phone. I opened up the scriptures and I turned unto Psalm 118. You know, to my surprise, my eyes were fixed on verse 17, not on verse 1. Verse 17 of Psalm 118 reads like this. Let me read it for you. I will not die. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. On, in 19 it says, the Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. He has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. I shall not die, but live and declare thy works. I started crying and telling Lord, thank you for giving me this promise that I'm not going to die, but I'm going to live to declare thy works. 
what is there Lord for me to declare? Then the Lord told me, you know, I am going to heal you without any surgery. No knife will be kept in your body. And I will make your body as a renewed one. I will make your skin as that of a child. But one thing I did not like in you, he said. I asked, Lord, tell me what is that? He spoke to me from two scriptures. Both these scriptures talk about the same thing. Let me read it out for you. The first one, James, the book of James, which is right after the book of Hebrews, that is James chapter 4, verse 6, it says like this. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, it says, humble yourself, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. And right before that it says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. He told me, Vinod, I know you are a hypocrite. On top of that, you became very proud because of your beauty because of your richness, because of your knowledge, because of your intelligence, because of all your prosperity. It is not you who gain, it is not you who gained any of this. It is me who have given you everything. But on top of that, instead of humbling you, you became proud. I have to oppose you. I don't want you to go to hell. That's why I have to chasten you in this bed. I have to discipline you. On that day, I lifted up my hands and cried unto the Lord and surrendered my life unto him and I confessed my sin. In his mercy, he cleansed me. He forgave all my sins. He reinstated me as his child. He poured upon his Holy Spirit upon me as he has promised me no knife is yet to be kept in my body. Without that, he delivered me out of the hospital on the 2nd of July. He reinstated my health. He reinstated my wealth. He reinstated the life that I have lost. He reinstated the relationship with this true living God. From there on, my life started to grow spiritually. And in 2012, I had an opportunity to visit Bihar. When I went to Bihar for a mission trip to see the work, what God is doing there, I came to see a lot of people, believers, who are struggling with sin like how I used to be without knowing what is sin. That's when God spoke to me, you know, why can't you disciple these people? Why can't you teach them the word of God? I told him, God, I don't know even one word of Hindi. He told me, I'll put my words in your mouth. You will be my spokesperson. I will use you for my glory. Then I had an opportunity to meet a dear brother, Dr. A.B.P. Matthew, who is heading India Mission, a mission organization based in Bihar. I shared with him, this is what the God spoke to me. He said, brother, we have been praying for such a person for years now. Immediately I was moved and I started working there along with my job. I used to come there for a year. I started equipping people there through the word of God by conducting a two-week discipleship training. Then the God put into my heart, it's not enough what you're doing. So he enabled me to give up my job and take up this as my full-time duty not as a profession, as a duty. Since 2013, God is using me in the mission fields of Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Uttar Pradesh. And India Mission, his organization, and Dr. ABP Matthew, and all my fellow co-workers there have given me the helping hand. God is using me to teach the word of God to these people in a two-week discipleship training. Several people are repenting and being torn apart, torn apart by the word of God, which is sharper than any double-edged sword. The word is shaping them. The word is cleansing them. The word is renewing their relationship with the Lord. As we read in Mark 3, 13 and 14, he chose the 12 so that they can be with him 
and if they are be if they are with him he will send them to preach and have authority over demons and heal sicknesses that's how god is using me enabling me to be with him and he is sending me to preach the word of god and he is helping me to minister and to his people and to the gentiles my dear friends i just want to give you this opportunity to join with me in prayer if any of you are struggling with any of these passions the worldly passions be it youth youthful passions be it love of money be it whatever it is let me tell you one more thing for the last 6 years i am not taking any financial support from the mission organization with whom we are working i am not working for them i am working for the lord he is providing me all that is needed we are blessed with two wonderful boys as i said the elder one has completed his degree in physics his bachelor's in physics from one of the top most colleges in india st stephens the younger one has finished grade 12 it's all because of god's mercy he is providing us all our needs see this is another opportunity of he keeping his promise which he told me on 24th june 2010 you shall not die but live and declare the works of the lord that's why i'm talking to you through this webcast please submit yourself unto the lord turn unto him and accept your failure you cannot hide anything from him everything is open and naked in front of him confess it unto him tell him lord i'm struggling with this there are so many sins which has entangled me kindly deliver me i'm just going to pray for you join with me in prayers father we thank you for this wonderful time that you have given us thank you for this great opportunity to minister to your people oh lord for your glory father you are a god who can do everything and none of your purposes can be thwarted father thank you for saving me and your family thank you for using me for your glory I just want to pray unto you, like me. Is there any families who are hearing me, any persons who are hearing me, a Lord who are struggling with any addictions, hypocrisy, pretending, for the youthful passions, worldly passions, love of money, lust. Father, give them grace. Forgive them, O Lord, all their sin. and the lord fill them with your spirit as you said i'll pour out my spirit in you and i'll make you to walk according to my statutes and my decrees make them a lord obedient children of god give them grace so that when their sins are forgiven they receive more grace so that they do not sin any more but rather obey you wholeheartedly give them grace to believe and continue to believe in you father we pray for all these opportunities that you are providing us through your people bless them and use all of them for your glory in jesus name i pray thank you my dear friends for giving your time to hearing me may god bless you and use you also in the days to come amen god bless you thank you